I'm good. Alrighty. Okay, so welcome to uh, Wild West Hackfest, right? Or I guess I'm not welcoming you here. You've been here a while. Um, but uh, today we're doing Windows privilege escalation tricks. This is kind of a, a, a sequel to last year where we did Linux privilege escalation tricks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and caveat before we get started here that uh, if you are looking for a revolutionary O-Day um, or literally anything that hasn't been documented before, you are in the wrong place. Right? Um, if, on the other hand, you're looking for things that we use regularly in red team assessments to escalate on Windows, you are in exactly the right place. Uh, it turns out that uh, while these techniques that we're going to go over are uh, almost too basic to work, like every time one works, I kind of step back and say, wow, that shouldn't have worked. And everyone here, I'm positive, I'll get some questions afterwards where people are like, but but default directory permissions or whatever, yep, that's the point, right, defaults, right? Uh, of course, we don't have a lot of defaults in industry. We have lots of folks that mess things up and in wonderful ways. In some cases, Global Knowledge and Learning Tree actually coach people, uh, system admins, on how to mess this stuff up, so that's awesome. Uh, meaning, like, we've actually root caused some of these misconfigurations back to uh, actual training manuals, training material, uh, for how to do uh, good systems administration, right? Uh, good being air quoted, right? Um, so again, walk through some of these tricks. Again, like I said, caveating right up front in case you have someplace better to be. There is no O-Day material here, right? Uh, literally, we're walking through the stuff that we use to escalate on a regular basis in Windows. Uh, so who am I? Uh, I'm actually the founder and president of Rendition, um, soon to be former SANS instructor, right? So this is uh, seven years coming to an end, uh, but I've got three more classes left in December. Uh, that's it, right? I was formally endorsed by the Shadow Brokers. That was uh, both awesome and, and not awesome. Um, <coughs> actually, it wasn't awesome at all. Uh, but uh, anyway, formally endorsed by the Shadow Brokers. Uh, didn't used to talk about this a lot, but the former NSA hacker thing, uh, that's what they endorsed me for. So I'm happy about that, I guess, Wh whatever. Anyway, dislikes, uh, people th call themselves thought leaders. If you are a thought leader and you have to tell people, you are not a thought leader. Kind of like leaders in general, right? Leaders in general, they, they don't have to tell you they're a leader. They, they just do, right? Um, and then blockchain. Oh my gosh, blockchain, right? Hey, before we get going, though, I want to have a quick rant. And uh, that's all about hacker culture, right? And I'll tell you that over the last couple of years, I'm seeing a major tectonic shift in InfoSec. And it's the just press the easy button. And look, I, I understand InfoSec culture not equal to hacker culture. I totally get it. I don't know what we're at here, whether this is like a hacker con or InfoSec con or a little bit of both or whatever. Um, but I run into a lot of folks who are like, yeah, I want to be a hacker. I'm going to be a hacker. I am a hacker, whatever. And then you're like, cool, how does that work? And then they're like, I run the script. I'm like, what does the script do? And they're like, it does stuff. And I'm like, right, but what does it do? And they're like, yeah, it gives me privileges, right? And I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's not it, right? When we started out in the whole hacker culture scene, right, and I'm actually old enough, I'm losing hair here, uh, old enough to remember this kind of thing, right? Um, you know, it was all about learning how stuff worked. You learned how everything worked at a deep level, uh, whether that involved reverse engineering it, and, and there are different levels of deep, right? But it really came down to learn how stuff works learn the system of rules. I almost feel like Morpheus, kind of in the Matrix thing here, right? But, but learn the system of rules when it comes down to it so that you can go break those rules. So that's really what it comes down to, right? So we have got to return to a, a culture, at least some of us, right, uh, in the room here need to return to that culture of knowing how it works because a huge number of security issues, both, in the, both on the blue team side, stuff we can prevent, and the red team side, stuff we can exploit, uh, again, it, it's trivial once you understand what normal looks like, once you understand how the systems themselves actually work. Reverse the course, 100% reverse the course. So the agenda, right? We're going to talk about misconfigurations and why are we focused on the misconfigurations. Um, then we're going to talk about some interesting path uh, configurations and other misconfigurations and talk about some software uninstallations or uh, uninstalled software that really isn't. Uh, has anybody ever uh, done a lot of software uninstallations and then gone back and found remnants of that software still there? Yeah, lots of third-party software packages are tremendously bad at this, right? This ends up being a huge source, a uh, huge potential source of compromise in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases, we still see service keys that are uh, pointing to directories that no longer exist, but in many cases, we can create. Uh, there's also some COM objects that we can use, and we'll talk a little bit about those as we close out today. Uh, but bottom line, uh, there's a lot that we can play with here uh, on a Windows system without ever getting into a binary O-Day, right? So why focus on misconfigurations in the first place? Um, you know, there's a lot of spots where people come back and they say, hey, um, d should you really be looking at system, systems admins failing, right? Don't we really want instead uh, to get in and do binary exploitation? Is that what, you know, vulnerability management, pen testing, that's what it's all about, right? Showing they didn't patch something. I actually argue with this, right? How many folks have run Nessus before? Yeah, it's like everybody, right? Okay, cool. Uh, how many folks have ever found a misconfiguration on a Windows system with Nessus? Yeah, and that's a much smaller number of hands, right? If I say, how many folks found a missing patch with Nessus? 
right? That's like everybody, right? And so the delta here is that Nessus, and I'm not knocking Nessus, by the way, Nessus and vulnerability scanners in general suck at detecting misconfigurations. They're really bad at it. The reason is that there's no easy signature for a misconfiguration. Most of the stuff we're gonna walk through here today isn't about a specific misconfiguration. We'll talk about a few specifics, don't get me wrong, but, but really we're looking at things that system admins do to make their jobs easier, demonstrably easier, and also less secure at the same time. Now the problem is with a lot of this stuff, Microsoft historically has been really bad, and I'm not picking on Microsoft, by the way, they're getting way better. Uh, they've done some amazing work, but they've historically been really bad in their documentation where they'll say, hey, to accomplish this thing you system admins are asking about, insert the following registry value. And there's a little asterisk beside it that says, may have unintended consequences with, re with respect to privilege assignment and debug, right? And you're like, what does that even mean? I mean, that's literally Greek to the majority of our system admins, right? What they hear is, Literally, it's like the old, remember the old SSL browser buttons, right? Yeah, SSL, not TLS, right? The, the SSL certificate is incorrect. Most users literally looked and said, something is preventing me from doing my job. Click here to proceed. That's what your system admins are seeing, right? They see this must set registry key to continue kind of thing, and they do it without understanding at the asterisk side all that Greek that goes along there, and this causes all kinds of issues. Again, we're gonna focus on common misconfigurations that we find in enterprise environments. I, look, I love unpatched binary vulnerabilities and O-days, uh, and a lot of the stuff you'll find with these are technically O-days, but I air quote this because when you have an unquoted service path or a uh, improper directory permission, yes, it's a vulnerability, yes, it's an O-day. Uh, the vast majority of cases, it ends up being a misconfiguration, right? Um, so again, these are, these are fun. Uh, a lot of pen testers today rely on them for 100% of privilege escalation. There are a whole world of, world of misconfigurations. Uh, we, we pwned a major bank, uh, actually, uh, earlier this year, um, well, technically, late last year, and then again early this year, because uh, they still hadn't fixed the misconfiguration, but uh, pwned them twice in, in two red team assessments. Uh, and again, it was just a basic misconfiguration, their golden image. Uh, and the thing that we got back, we actually, how many folks have run a red team assessment, and you turn over the results, and people are like, no, that's wrong. You couldn't have done that, because that's wrong. Right? And that's what they came back and said. They said that you're, you're wrong. Right? Now, this is a bank, by the way. Everybody knows the name of this bank. Right? I, I would hazard a guess that a, a, a non-zero number of you are carrying their ATM card around in your pocket. And I've got the system admin team coming back to me and saying, you're wrong. Right? Well, okay, cool, but demonstrably, I, I achieved system on your every system that we landed on, you know, system permissions. Um, I'm not wrong. Uh, the reason they thought we were wrong, uh, they ran the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Security Baseline Analyzer, which is now dead anyway, but MBSA still work for Windows 7, and that's what they're on. Uh, and so, ran the MBSA for Windows 7, and that didn't come back with anything, and then they ran Nessus, and that didn't come back with anything either. And so they must be secure, right? Of course not, right? And that's really what we want to get into in the talk here, right? So, Misconfigurations, and this is another problem here, they're recommended by training that system admins take. Now listen, uh, when, you know, can I step back here, and if you've worked in this field for a long time, and I talk about path permissions, and you're like, duh, everybody knows that. Let me stop you right there, and I'm gonna tell you not everybody knows that, right? Um, now here, we're in a security echo chamber, right? This is one of the hackier conferences that I go to, and I mean that in a, in a positive way, right? I don't mean like hackier, like hacked together or something. I mean hackier in that there are more actual hackers in the room um, than at a lot of other security conferences that I go to. Uh, that said, I expect more of you to understand some of these techniques than a lot of other uh, more general conferences, but I will mention here, uh, security is all about CIA, and this is really where our vulnerabilities come from, or a lot of these misconceptions configurations come from. Most of your system admins have a single KPI, one thing they get rated on, and that's availability. That's availability. If you want to move the needle, right, and I mean the, more than anything else I'm going to talk about in this talk, if you want to go move the needle in your organization for security, go back, talk to your CIO, your CTO, et cetera, and rewrite system admin job descriptions. Rewrite system admin job descriptions and include confidentiality and integrity of data configuration management and vulnerability management becomes part of the job description and then they get rated on it. That is the thing that we can, when we consult uh, rendition with organizations, that is the one thing we recommend. It is the one thing that moves the needle more than anything else because you're suddenly putting in the admin's pocket basically the either do this or you're gonna get rated poorly, right? So that said, let's talk about permissioning all the things, right? I have no idea who originally found all these techniques, right? I wanna give credit where credit's due. I will say Will Schroeder and Matt Graber have done a great deal of work in this area. Um, I'm positive that a lot of these techniques have been found independently over the years, right? Uh, you know, whereas when somebody looks and says, wow, I can abuse that directory permission kind of thing, right? I'm positive that's been done. Uh, thanks to everyone who's taken time to document privilege escalation tricks over the years. So 
one of the first things I want to talk about is NTFS, NTFS file system permissions. A lot of people look at this as just read, write, and full control. But there's a huge number of other permissions available that most people don't recognize, right? And the two that we really want to talk about here specifically are this, uh, basically the create files and write data and the create folders and append data. These two permissions here are toxic. They're absolutely toxic, right? Um, if you have these permissions enabled on a directory where regular users, the built-in users group, can write data to a directory, Right now, you can't overwrite a file. Generic write permission allows you to overwrite existing files. These only allow you to add files, or in some cases, append data to an existing file. Don't worry, we can still leverage both of those, right, uh, when it comes down to it. But this, these are the permissions where people are like, no, no, they don't have write permissions. And the problem with this showing up, right, when we start looking at NTFS permissions, is that <clears throat> we start looking here. I had to go into the advanced, uh, basically the advanced feature to see this. What you'll see is at the bottom, where they have full control, write, et cetera, there's a checkbox that says special permissions. And if any of your special permissions are set, that checkbox shows up, but it doesn't show you what the special permissions are, right? So as you start talking about, hey, system admins, why are you screwing this up? This is like six clicks deep, right? Meaning like you have to click, 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 click to get here. Uh, again, what they're seeing is a little checkbox that says special permissions, and it could be any of the special permissions that are set. They don't really have visibility on that. Now for you, because we're not GUI rangers, right? We're just not. We're command line, we're command line all the way, right? We're gonna use the iCackles tool, right? And I'll be honest, since I saw the, uh, what was that, shallow howl, I can't read iCackles and not think about cankles. I don't know what the deal is there, right? Um, now you won't be able to either, my gift to you, right? But uh, <coughs> iCackles, iCackles shows us the actual, uh, basically the actual permissions assigned to the directory. And again, what we're looking for here is the built-in users group. Now in most cases, this I over here is gonna be set, right? Now I'm gonna show you a couple of examples as we move through that don't have the I. The I means inherited, right? So by default, NTFS is gonna inherit permissions from the parent directory. But you can also add permissions to a subdirectory, which then get inherited by all the files in the directory, as well as any subdirectories that get created, right? Again, the two that we're looking for here, uh, and this is much easier, this is literally one type versus six clicks uh, per folder. And so what we're looking for here again is the built-in users group. And of course, this could be any other group that you actually authenticate as, right? If you land uh, a phishing email and your user is in like eight different groups, by all means, check all the groups, right? Rock on. But, but users, everybody that's authenticated to the machine is in the built-in users group, right? Um, you can't remove them from that, uh, you know, and everybody's automatically in it. Game on, right? And so what we're going to look for here is a second entry, most often a second entry with users. And we're looking for basically what's not inherited, any special permissions that are set, right? All Although again, sometimes uh, if we're looking at a subdirectory where stuff is set before, uh, we're gonna see that, uh, see that inherit as well. So if you're looking to take a photo, this is the one to take a photo of, the specific, specific permissions that we care about, right? Delete, we can remove a config file or remove a DLL. And I'll tell you one of the reasons that I like to do this, if I have delete permissions but not write permissions. If I can delete a DLL uh, from the, uh, basically from the directory, so say I'm looking at a third party application, and that's gonna be the majority of what we're gonna attack here, are third party apps that run in a privileged context. If I can delete a DLL from their directory, and I actually have control of the search path or can write anywhere else in the search path, we can load another DLL that'll load in a privileged context, right? So the delete permission's important for us, but the one that matters the most is the write data and add file. Now, I teach a class at Black Hat. Uh, we've taught this uh, a couple years running. We teach it occasionally outside of Black Hat. It's a four day on code injection, right? And uh, one of the techniques that we teach there actually involves building what we call proxy DLL. All right, so a proxy DLL, you may be familiar with the whole idea of DLL sideloading. One of the problems with DLL sideloading is that if you just grab a generic DLL from a interpreter, like use MSF Venom and you're like, create me a DLL, this DLL does not export all of the things, the functionality the program relies on. So what happens is it's gonna load the DLL, you're gonna get a call back and then you immediately disconnect. And people are like, what happened? Right? What happened is the program crashed. Right? So before you got your stager code completely up there, before your session completes, the program itself crashes because your DLL isn't exporting what's actually expected. Right? So it's one of those like you were successful, successful right, um, in getting code execution, but you're not successful in like maintaining a callback. Right? A very easy way to get around this without having to go into like the details of creating a proxy DLL, because we're not doing that today, that's a little bit more in depth. Right? Uh, but uh, the way to get around that is to use a payload that doesn't involve a callback. Right? So one of the payloads we use very often there in Meterpreter, 
uh, or sorry, uh, Metasploit uh, is basically to go add a user, right? So you can go add the user hacker or the password a hacker or whatever. Uh, and basically then you can go log in or privilege escalate with a run as command or, or whatever the case is there, right? Um, that said though, I'll mention here with the proxy DLL side, again, I teach us, it's a four day class at Black Hat. Day three in the afternoon we teach this, right? Um, and basically show people how to do this. Day four, uh, we actually roll a bunch of beer into the, uh, oh wait, I'm being recorded here. Um, some people bring beer apparently back from lunch um, and uh, not me, definitely not me, uh, but some people bring beer back from lunch. We're going to capture the flag in the afternoon, right? Basically to kind of round the day out there, or round the course out. Uh, usually by 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, we are cranking away. Uh, Black Hat has a hard stop at 5 o'clock, right? So we're talking about two and a half, three hours maybe. Uh, last year, we had uh, four different zero-day privilege escalation vulnerabilities discovered in 2018. Uh, this year, we had five. Right? And these are all in commercial software packages where when you ran the MSI installation, it granted these permissions to the directory it created. Right? So as it went in and said program files, whatever, it automatically granted these. Now the reason for this is your MSI build scripts. Right? So if you use install shield, um, install shield by default copies your permissions. And so if you have those explicit permissions, it doesn't say now go create a directory and just inherit, no. Nope. And this is actually a good thing in most cases, right? Before you like tilt your head and you're like, oh, those idiots, right? No, this is actually a good thing. It provides a good deal of reliability, right? From an installation package creation side, um, but it also has huge side effects, right? And so what we find then is basically as we're installing these services, installing these third party software services, uh, basically they're leaving those directory permissions set. Um, ultimately these run in a privileged context, right? And so by leaving the add file uh, directory permission set, we can drop a DLL in there that gets loaded by the executable in that privileged context. Now, write attributes is actually interesting here. Uh, here you can go set file attributes to hidden or system. The only reason this becomes really interesting is hiding files from view uh, by most admins. I am still amazed at the number of system admins that do not know about the slash a switch for the dir command, um, but I have run into this again and again and again. We're simply setting the system permission because if you have a file with a system permission or a hidden bit, uh, dir doesn't show that, right? Uh, so you actually have to do a dir with a slash a to show all the hidden. Uh, so again, this might be useful for you uh, again, if you're going up against, you know, basically like junior level system admin guy, right? Uh, guy or gal, of course. Uh, then of course, append data. Here we're going in, we can add data to the end of a file, but we can't overwrite existing data. This is of limited use. Uh, there are some conditions where this actually makes a huge difference. Most of the time, it's not that big of a deal. But if you picture that I've got a configuration file, uh, one of the things that we've, uh, that we've had in the past, I've got service configuration files where they have a startup and a shutdown script. Right now, even though the configuration file already has a startup and a shutdown script, you know, already, already specified, because I can append data, if you think about the way most of these configuration files are processed, they're processed linearly. So basically what happens is they, they log the original startup script and then they log my startup script overwriting the original startup script in the config file, right? Now I'm not really overwriting it, but the way it's processed in memory ultimately happens there. And I can point that to a script I control, right, given a full path, right? So again, this is one of these that's a little bit, it's not everything, right, which is why I'm really looking for this, right? If you find this in a third party installer that runs in a privileged context, game on, you found an O-Day, right? I mean, you can totally report these. In fact, uh, is that SCOTUS in here? It is not, I don't see Ed. Okay, never mind. So I was gonna mention, uh, I gave a talk on DLL sideloading a couple of years ago at the uh, SANS uh, Pentest Hackfest. And uh, it was really interesting. I was flying back from uh, Australia, actually, and uh, downloaded a bunch of software before I got on the plane. I was flying Virgin Australia. They don't have, or didn't have internet at the time. Downloaded a bunch of third-party software before I got on the plane to fly back to Hackfest. And uh, basically landed that night, uh, like 11 p.m., whatever, got up on stage at like 10 in the morning and uh, said, man, you know, told the story. I'm like, I downloaded a bunch of software and then I looked for some, some O-Days and sure enough, what do you know, I found a couple of these and, you know, let's take a look at these, right? And, uh, you know, I'm like, this is how easy it is, right? I downloaded like eight software packages, found privilege escalation O-Days, the DLL side loading of two of them. And I got off the stage, Ed kind of pats me on the back there. He's like, that was a great talk. He's like, I'm like, thanks, man, right? And uh, then Ed says, I am particularly impressed by your time management. And I'm like, well, I didn't know time management was a thing. I mean, I, I spoke, you know, got off the stage on time, right? Didn't run too long, didn't run too short. And he's like, oh, no, I meant your time management outside of the talk. He said, it was absolutely amazing to me that you're able to download software, land at, like, without internet, land at, like, 10 p.m., 11 p.m. at night, and then responsibly disclose those zero days before you got up on stage here. And I'm like, what, 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 feeling about like yay big, and Ed's like, yeah, never again, right? And I'm like, yeah, never again, exactly, right? Because of course that's his conference, right? Um, so anyway, uh, if you want to get on Ed's bad side, or at least whatever side, 
Grumpy, I think we're gonna go with Grumpy side there, uh, do that. Anyway, uh, so change permissions, right? Change permissions is the equivalent of full control, but it doesn't show up that way, right? So bear in mind, and Microsoft actually documents this pretty well, right? They, there's a big asterisk next to that one where they're like, this effectively is full control, just not labeled that way, right? Um, but bear in mind here, remember your system admins are looking at the default pane, right, which only shows special permissions box being checked, not which ones are actually checked themselves. But it doesn't stop with file system. We also have registry. Registry keys have permissions as well. The values do not. This is a pretty critical thing here in that basically any value you create, and this is where a lot of misconfigs come from, any values created under a key have all the same permissions as the key itself. Very often what happens is, is that somebody needs to read or modify, basically a generic user needs to read or modify a value, and as a result the key gets set so that they have write permissions, so that a generic user has write permissions to the key. The problem is that influences every value under the key as well as in the default config, all the sub keys and values of those keys. Uh, tell me if you can't see what's going on here. Never mind, Ray Charles can see what's going on here, right? And so we're gonna find poor directory permissions. We find these regularly. I'll mention here that uh, finding registry keys writable by the authenticated user groups, this is really unusual, right? I don't find this a lot. What I do find is I find other groups that users are in, right? So the user that I've fished onto the box with or I have creds for, um, they're in a group that ultimately has write permissions to a key, right? So it's really rare to find authenticated users, but a third party or a custom group that's been configured uh, that's actually pretty common, right? Um, so <clears throat> I'll mention here that in a lot of cases, um, they actually have plug-in DLLs as values, and I love this. I mean, this is one where I don't have to do any work here. If I've got a plug-in DLL and it's like, load this DLL into the service, I'm like, game on, right? Literally just point it to your DLL and you're good to go there, right? Um, oh, by the way, again, with plug-in DLLs, uh, you're gonna have to do specific exports. Again, MSF Venom is not gonna be your friend here, right? Um, again, there's a lot of work that goes into this, and this is one of the reasons that we don't see, you know, to building a proxy DLL. With a proxy DLL, effectively what you're gonna do is you're actually going to export every single function that the original DLL did, right? Uh, likewise here with a plug-in DLL, likely in order to use the plug-in, they're calling specific exports. So you're actually gonna have to go through and build those. This is something that requires you to learn to code, right? Um, or learn lots of Python so that you can do metacoding and whatever. That's what we do. We actually have Python scripts that generate the C code, or at least the C wrapper for us, and then we write the rest of our code internally. So there's also a tool, sub and ACL, right? Uh, this is part of the Windows resource kit that gets permissions for registry keys. Now, a lot of people come back and like, but Jake, you can use PowerShell. And I'm like, yes, but have you seen PowerShell, right? Um, I love PowerShell. Let me be very clear, I love PowerShell, right? But I want you to look at this, and, and you see how awesome this is, where they're like, cool, what do you have? And, and they literally walk through individual privileges. And then you have this, right? 28463554456 and negative 2147486, exactly, right? Uh, what's going on here, by the way? Right? Why, why do we see giant numbers of, of nastiness here with PowerShell? Basically what happens here, every permission, that, every permission that you have is a bit mask, right? And what this generally means is, most often when you see big numbers here, it means special permissions are set. Every special permission has an individual bit, right? And then we interpret that 32-bit value, right? We're looking at a signed number of negative 2.1 billion to positive 2.1 billion. And so what you're seeing here is PowerShell helping you, air quotes, helping you by converting this bit stream of ones and zeros into a number. That's not help with friends like PowerShell who needs enemies, right? This is why I highly recommend, it's one of 18 reasons I highly recommend bringing sub and ACL. Uh, this is a free download from Microsoft. It's part of the old Windows resource kits, but it still works all the way through to Windows 10. Uh, absolutely love it. Highly, highly, highly recommend this as your go-to tool. I'll also mention that PowerShell used to be awesome, right? A few years ago, we went to PowerShell and we didn't want to get caught. And today, if you want to get caught, go to PowerShell, right? Seriously, I mean, you have to be blind, dead, and dumb in an uh, enterprise network today to not be logging PowerShell with block logging, right? Script block logging, PowerShell version five and above. Right? And again, this is a, uh, it's, it's a real problem today. And, and look, uh, bottom line, when you start going and grabbing ACLs right, around registry keys and this starts to get logged, who does this? Nobody, nobody in the history of ever legitimate, well, I mean, maybe. But bottom line, this sticks out like a sore thumb. Right? This reads like a book. Any incident responder looking through the PowerShell logs is gonna be like, no. Right? They may not know what you're doing, but they know it's not normal. Right? They can bounce through and look historically and say, has this ever happened elsewhere before? And the answer is going to be no. Right? So let's start with path hijacks. Now that we've talked about misconfigurations in general, if any portion of the system path variable is writable by authenticated users, it is almost certain. And I, 
I hate, you know, uh, hate certainty here. I would hate to say it's absolutely certain because somebody will have a counterexample. But if anything's writable, 99.999% of the time in the path variable, you're going to be able to privilege escalate. This is actually one of the vulnerabilities I found uh, coming out of Hackfest. They didn't call an executable by the path. And I will tell you, actually, I'm going to quiz here real quick. I've got a rendition chip. If somebody knows, what's the most common executable called from inside a, uh, basically from inside a program, inside a service? Most common Microsoft program called by service. Anybody know? Oh, it's not SVC host. No, this is actually something that folks run. What is it? Uh, RegServe32 is pretty common. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll give you one for that. So RegServe32 RegServe uh, is actually not bad, uh, but I'll tell you the one that's the most common by far is NetSH. NetSH is called all the time, right? It turns out that it is a giant pain in the butt uh, to go get an IP address and go get networking, network configuration information by calling Windows APIs. But what you can do is you can run NetSH and parse the output, and a ridiculous, redonkulous number of developers do this, right? Um, you can get firewall data with this. You can, by the way, if you don't know NetSH, you should totally learn NetSH as a red teamer. Learn NetSH. How many folks know that you can use NetSH like TCP dump? Yeah, that's not nearly enough hands, right? Because if you're looking to go capture packets, there's a trace feature with NetSH, and you can use it just like TCP dump, except better. What does it give you that TCP dump doesn't? Let me know. Yeah, processes. There you go, right? So you run TCP dump, you get uh, basically you get traffic, right? You run uh, NetSH on the other hand, you get the process ID that generated the traffic. The individual at an individual packet level, which is uh, rocking, right? Anyway, so NetSH, learn it, know it, love it. Bottom line, uh, one of the O days that we discovered uh, literally was a service, unsurprisingly, was calling NetSH. And so we started running Procmon, started looking around at this. Uh, basically, it's running uh, NetSH. And then we looked at the path variable, and it turns out that uh, they had basically inserted their program files directory at the beginning of the path. Wah, wah, wah. What meant that meant is they were going to call and look for NetSH literally everywhere but System32 where it's actually at. This is a, a losing move, as it turns out, right? And so what we're looking here is that if the system admins don't leave System32 as the first directory, you almost always have this uh, privilege escalation opportunity. So let me show you an example of this, right? And by the way here, when you get on as an unauthenticated user, and that, that's where I'm at here, rendition is not an authenticated user. Uh, when you get on as an unauthenticated user, uh, don't just type set. A lot of people like set and then look at your path. Your problem there is you're looking at the combination of the system path and the user extensions to the path, right? Which can preempt the system path in some cases and when you have weird configurations set up. Bottom line, I've seen a lot of folks fail with this because, specifically because, they don't go and actually get the real path data, right? So this is the key that you're going to query here for the environment data. And you'll notice here that this directory, MyDir, uh, is prepended to the beginning of the path, right? And of course, this makes sense. I need to go in and add a directory. If you've ever done this before using the not uh, command line method, right? Um, you know that it pops up and you've got like yay big on the window. And of course, everything's scrolling over to the side there. And you have two choices. You can click inside the window and hold the right arrow key to go to the end. Or you can click at the very beginning, type the directory name in a semicolon, and click apply. Which one do you think admins do? Exactly, right? And so without understanding why this matters, right, why the path order actually matters from a security standpoint, remember, we have effectively, and, and by the way, too, if you're thinking, uh, kind of stepping back and thinking root cause security stuff, man, the power of defaults, holy goodness, the power of defaults, right? Because we have coached the system admins into having to do more work to not end up in an exploitable condition. Anyway, TLDR, MITRE, and then we're going to pop back over and use our friend iCackles. And so if we find a non-standard directory, go check the permissions. Now notice here I've got a second, uh, basically a second set of permissions here. Remember before I said WD and AD were the ones I cared about? Well, those are on the special permission side. Here I just have right access to the directory, so it's so a game on, right? So what we have here effectively is right access to a, uh, to a path, right? Um, we had this actually occur in uh, basically this path hijacking. I had this occur real life in a, uh, <coughs> in a large healthcare organization, uh, the system admins had actually, uh, were trying to do things securely, right? So I kid you not, uh, one of the findings uh, a while back had been, hey, you're consistently doing this whole PS exec thing. Um, 
to basically go PS exec to a compromised machine. They would get an antivirus alert, and their standard operating procedure was then to go PS exec to the compromised machine to investigate. Um, this is also known as handing credentials to the attacker, right? Let's not do that. Um, and so what they figured out was that they could go pre-stage a bunch of tools, right, that they were, they were going to need otherwise, and they could use the EDR to go run those third-party tools, right? So that actually is not horrible. The problem is, uh, in order to make that all go, they actually added their special directory to the path, um, and they left the directory writable uh, by built in, the built-in users group, right? And so now what you have effectively is now an attacker can go in, of course, and path hijack, right? So let's say I've got a service, again, a very, very common scenario here, a service that involves networking of any variety is very likely to call NetSH. If my path is set up this way, right, and I have NetSH being called, I can add any program named NetSH into my DIR, right, and from there, we're going to get called in a privileged context. Now we've elevated, elevated privileges, right? Now again, I want to be clear, Nessus is never going to pick this up for you. And this is not a knock on Nessus. It's not a knock on Nessus, right? Um, it's just a reality of there's no signature specifically for this. This is a, a really a rinse, lather, repeat kind of thing here, right? We have to go through, start looking at directories, look at our different, uh, basically our different permissions that we have assigned, and then move from there. So let's talk about abusing services. Attackers are going to use a huge number of ways to abuse services. Uh, executable replacement, they may add a DLL to the service directory, right? Uh, service configuration file modification, right? Certainly registry key uh, might allow replacement the image path value. This is my favorite. I love this. This one happens more often than you more often than you might think if you haven't looked for this before. And then finally, unquoted service paths, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So with the executable replacement, basically we're going to go query services, and I'll walk you through how to query those in just a minute here from, that's right, the command line, because we do everything on the command line. By the way, what does CLI stand for? Cache line interface, because those who know how to use it make a hell of a lot more cache than those who don't, right? Go ahead and look around and tell me I'm wrong. All the people you know that are like the full-on command line ninjas, tell me they're not making bank. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, why? It's not because the command line is sexy, right? And I'll pay that person more because they can do the command line. It's hard to automate a GUI. It's hard to automate a GUI, right? And so if all you know how to do is, is GUI click, 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 right? It's super easy to automate command line stuff. And so the people that know how to command line, they tend to make more because they tend to do more work when it comes down to it. Not because they're working harder, they're actually working lazier, but they're getting more done, right? So anyway, executable service replacement here, right? The attacker basically has write permissions to the service executable. We don't write permissions to the registry key, but we look at specifically where the service executable is at, do a directory list there, an eye cackles, and we're gonna basically check to see can we overwrite the executable. If yes, eh, maybe, right? Um, before you say definitely we're good, maybe you're good. The biggest problem that I run into here is that Windows locks executables open during runtime. You've probably experienced this before if you've tried to delete a piece of malware that's running, and Windows says no, and you're like, but I'm the admin, and Windows says no. Right? No, I don't care, right? And by the way, anybody know the technical reason for this? Let me know? Okay, well, technical reason for this actually it comes down to the page file. Windows doesn't page executables to the page file. The thought process there is we've already got a copy of it on disk, why bother? Right? And so they use the executable itself as the underlying backing store or page file, right? The technical term is backing store. And that's why you can't delete it. I now have a problem because I can't delete it and I also can't overwrite it. So if the service is running, and this, this gets me in a lot of frustrating scenarios, right, where I'll come in and I'll be like, but the service is running, and I, but I have write permissions to it, I have to wait somehow for the service to stop, right? Now this becomes really, really difficult in some scenarios if it's an auto start service. Uh, you may be able to socially engineer your way into a stop, that, that may be the case there, uh, but this one tends to be a little bit more difficult. Now, I'll mention that uh, this is one of the checks that's done in PowerUp, and I regularly see on a couple of message boards that we're in, people talk about, and they're like, yeah, power up won't work, it's broken. Is it broken? No, now we're back to the hacker culture stuff we were talking about earlier, right? Uh, power up said it was good, but then it couldn't escalate, right? Well, why couldn't it escalate? Well, you've got weak directory permissions, but you can't overwrite the executable because the service is running, right? If you understand under the hood what you're dealing with here, you can figure out a way to troubleshoot this out. Uh, ultimately, you're gonna have to find a way to stop the service, right? Now, I can think of lots of ways to do that. Potentially, maybe you can crash the service somehow. Uh, maybe you can resource starve the service. There's a lot of ways you can play with these. Again, our social engineer, the help desk, right? Although, calling up the help desk can be like, yeah, uh, I, if you could log on and maybe stop the, uh, uh, the uh, McAfee uh, land manager service, that, that'd, be, uh, that'd be awesome for the, no regular user has ever done that in the history of ever, right? So you're gonna have to work hard to, to get a good pretext to get the help desk to help you out, right? Um, that said, we can add a DLL to the service director. This is what we do at Black Hat, 
right? Uh, now, again, there's a few different ways to do this. Uh, adding the DLL is the easy part, right? Getting good code execution, reliable code execution is a little bit harder. Um, but uh, again, the big key here is unless you're doing a proxy DLL, the service is going to crash because you are not exporting the functionality expected by the service executable. Right? Um, but again, Metasploit payloads include the add a user, right? and here you don't care because by the time the service crashes, your code is already run. You won't get an interpreter session though. What you will see historically is you'll see a callback and it'll be like sending stage two, right? or sending your second stage, and then things hang. And you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're like, oh, I just need to do it again. And you do it again, and the same thing happens, and, right? and it'll keep happening, because again, the service is crashing before your code ever gets loaded there. You have no time to migrate, no time, because before interpreter is ever loaded, your process has crashed. Right? Oh, by the way, big distinction here, this has a huge advantage of not requiring the service to be stopped. Right? Um, now, I don't get automatic execution. If I've got services running, and I write a DLL into the service directory so it gets loaded instead of the regular DLL, it's not going to get loaded until the machine restarts or the service restarts. Right? Most of the time, we're talking about auto start service, so when the machine reboots, we're automatically going to load our DLL. Right? But again, the big advantage here is that it doesn't require the service to be, uh, to be stopped in general. Uh, we actually had another bank that we pen tested uh, two years ago where we had a chance to do this for Oracle. Right? By the way, Oracle, uh, in many cases, for lots of legacy reasons, uh, mostly involving training, um, most often you don't install the Oracle database software, even if you're just database client, most often you don't install that in program files, it usually goes in C Oracle. I love this. I'm a big fan of this, um, as it turns out, uh, because most often the directory permissions are set open uh, so that you can write a couple of interesting pieces of data. Bottom line, we get that all set up, and then I'm like, cool, now I need to restart the service. Right? And then I found out they're running a VDI. And every time we restarted the VDI, we got a brand new image. And I was so annoyed. Right? So this took a lot of pretexting to get the help desk to help us restart a service executable, right? The Oracle, basically the Oracle process. The first four times we called, they're like, oh yeah, uh, we see what's going on there. We'll just uh, basically we'll reboot. What they mean by reboot is you literally are now getting a brand new VDI. And I'm like, no, right? But now I'm trying to be like on the phone, like, okay, so the rebooting is really not going to work for me here. Um, what I really need you to do is, is work with me here a lot, right? Because I really need to exploit your stuff, right? But anyway, um, bottom line, you can come up with a pretext there. VDIs become problematic here. But let's take a look at this. So here I'm using, uh, remember I said I'd use some command line stuff here, or show some command line stuff. Um, this is not 100% stealthy, right? Again, if you've got full command line auditing on, um, you, you're also going to look at this and be like, what is that, right? But I'm going to tell you, compared to looking at PowerShell logs, this is a heck of a lot stealthier. Way, way, way stealthier, right? Uh, a lot of folks that have command line auditing on don't have the full parameters, uh, the full command line parameters, and all they see is WMIC. It turns out that is actually another command line tool that gets run a lot uh, from inside of executables to avoid having to make API calls. So you'll notice here that we have this uh, directory here, uh, or sorry, this uh, service here, FResponse License Manager, LM, and I go take a look here at the directory, and what do you know, right? Uh, the users group has the WD write data and append data uh, permissions, right? So remember, write data is the one that we care about. That's where you can go add files and subdirectories, right? And so what we have now is the ability that when this service restarts, right, we're going to drop a DLL in this directory uh, based on the program files F response directory, and this restarts, we're going to gain execution as a system level user, system privilege user, right? And again, with a proxy DLL, everything will continue to run. Now, we may have a service that uses a configuration file. I mentioned this briefly before. The attacker has right access to the file. They can modify the entries. Uh, most commonly here, this is a startup and a shutdown script, uh, basically, for the, uh, basically for the service. Um, this is one of the weird uh, you know, ones here. It's least likely to be successful. And I don't mean because uh, you know, there's something that's going to block it. It's because most services don't use a configuration file. Most often, their config is in the registry which we're getting ready to talk about there too. Uh, the config is in the registry, and it turns out there, that may offer you some better, uh, some better opportunities. So here we show the example of, or talk about the example of modifying a service registry value. Uh, every service has a, a number of registry values, and again, I mentioned before, the keys themselves uh, are the only things that get permission. The values uh, in basically inherit all the permissions from the keys. In some rare cases, these service registry keys may be created so that a currently logged in user has write access. Again, this probably isn't going to be authenticated users built in group. It's probably going to be some third party group that got set up, uh, but it only has write access. We find this a lot with, and I'm not going to pick on anybody specifically here. Let's say it rhymes with smoracle. Um, and uh, But uh, we see this, uh, see this a lot, right? Um, where this, uh, this company creates uh, extra groups, and it turns out that in order to use their software effectively, like all the built in users have to be in those groups. And anyway, you can kind of chain that together and figure out where we're going there. 
When you replace the image path value, the attacker is executable. It gets executed with elevated permissions the next time the service is restarted. This is an automatic thing, right? But the next time the service gets restarted, you are going to gain that, uh, basically gain that privilege, right? Now, there's a caveat there for the next time the service gets restarted, by the way. Um, the service control manager won't automatically go reread the registry, right? So depending on how you do this, if you use the service controller calls, right, actual API calls, you automatically get it the next time. Otherwise, you get it in the next reboot. Right? So the service controller, the service control manager, doesn't actually go back and reread these keys every time it starts a service. It reads them once at boot. Right? But it doesn't really matter here. At the end of the day, you'll still get it the next reboot. Then we have unquoted service paths. Windows does not handle spaces and executable names gracefully at all. Ironically, a very popular smart card vendor totally screws this up. And I'm not going to mention which smart card vendor because I think we're still under NDA around any specifics, but I will say a particular smart card vendor in very popular use in uh, lots of places. Um, basically, their reader uh, installs a service so that they can integrate with a smart card, um, and ultimately, they end up with an unquoted service path and program files. Now, why do we care about this? Right? Well, it turns out that Windows with an unquoted path assumes that each, each space here, right? so as we look at these spaces, that each space might be the end of the executable and the beginning of the arguments. Right, the command line arguments. Right? So again, good developers put quotes around this stuff. Now, as far as like why might developers forget this, remember when they're quoting a string, they've already got quotes. So they have to add extra quotes inside so the quotes themselves end up in the registry. This is an easy thing for them to forget. And so as we look at an example of what happens with quotes, basically if I've got this custom, my custom app here, we're going to go first try to find program.exe, then programfiles.exe, then custom.exe, then my.exe, then my custom.exe. You've got a lot of opportunities here. If you can write an executable at any one of those locations, the next time that service restarts with the unquoted path, game on, right? Now, by the way, if you want to go find an O-Day, right? If everyone wants to go find an O-Day, and who doesn't, right? Um, on your Windows machine, tomorrow, tonight, after the talk, whatever, um, go and create a file named this, program.exe. Make it putty or calc or whatever it is that you have like a third party that runs without a deal. I like putty because it's immediately like, you know, discernible, right? Um, and it doesn't require any external DLLs like application specific DLLs. Name that program.exe. And by the way, Windows is going to be like, hey, that can cause lots of problems. Are you sure you want to do that? And you're going to say, yes, I do. 100% I want to do that, right? Um, and what you're going to do then is you're going to wait. And a couple months from now, putty's going to pop and you're like, oh, snap, somebody hacked my box. And then you're going to step back for a minute when your blood pressure lowers about 30 points, right? And then you're going to be like, oh, snap, we've got an unquoted path, right? And that's why that pops up, right? So basically, then you can pop up in Process Hacker uh, or uh, process, uh, process Explorer, and you can then go look at the parent lineage, and you can see what has the problem. And then you go report the O-Day responsibly, of course. I want to channel Ed Scotus here, right? Um, so there's also what we call an install always elevated key. This is a bad plan, horribly bad plan. But it turns out that a lot of folks for great, particularly in your smaller, medium shops, will deploy this because if you don't have a fully featured, fully configured SCCM installation, privilege management is a fickle, uh, fickle thing, a fickle thing. Let's go with that. As a fickle thing, right? Um, this key allows you to install as a regular user, right? So basically, a regular user is running but now we're running with elevated permissions. We find this all the time, right? Now, I'll mention not a big enterprises. Typically, it's the small, medium enterprise. Generally, that 500 to maybe 3,000 kind of employee or five, 500 to 5,000 kind of machine, right? We find this all the time. And so, highly recommend you check this because if this is set, now you can't automatically run something as an admin. You can only install software. And how does it know you're installing software? It basically looks to see, are you running an MSI? So if you can create an MSI, you'll automatically run with system permissions. What do you know? MSF Venom can do exactly that. MSF Venom can output whatever your payload is as an MSI. Now this, you don't have to worry about callbacks. It's going to call you back. You can migrate. You can do all your good stuff here. Uh, we're not going to crash any service processes or anything. Then we have unattended setups and upgrades. Right? So unattended setup uh, happens a lot here, where basically your admins will create what they call an answer file. They don't want to sit in front of Windows and click next, next type in the password, next. So they create this file, which has a freaking plain text password in it. Now, you can encode, as it turns out, because you'll notice here it says plain text true. What do you think the other option is? Yeah, it's base64 for the win, right? Um, which, contrary to popular belief among my system admin community, is not encryption, right? Um, anyway, so if you can run base64 minus D, you'd still be OK here. Regardless, uh, we can see then uh, passwords here. Now, these unattend.xml files should be removed after installation. 
they are frequently not removed, right? Now, I will tell you, this is one that I sometimes see vulnerability, manager, vul vulnerability management scanners or vuln scanners with the right plugins pick up on this. I'll tell you where I find this a lot, right? Because you can actually add additional third-party uh, accounts there as well, additional custom accounts. Where we see this a lot is uh, basically they've upgraded a golden image, right? Um, and they have a windows.old directory, and that's where we have the unattend.xml, right? So your vuln scanner is checking the current windows directory where there isn't one. But in the old upgrade, right, where they built the thing originally from sysprep, right, that's where they've got it. And of course, your vuln scanner misses this. We do not, right, because we run a full directive, full recursive directory listing, right? So um, again, I mentioned here as well, upgraded versions of Windows will move the original Windows directory to windows.old. Uh, this windows.old directory has all of the registry hives. And in a pen test uh, two years ago, uh, we found a windows.old directory that had generic read permissions, and that had been set across everything, right? Which meant built-in users could go grab the, that's right, the SAM hive, right? And so we went and grabbed this. Now, it's not the current SAM hive. I want to be very clear about this. It's the old SAM hive from before you upgraded. Okay, rock on. I, I, th this guy doesn't care, right? Um, anyway, so again, we should prevent access to the files, but again, we've observed this in the past, and I want to just throw this out as a trick because, you know, when you're sitting there scratching your head going, hey, what can I use to elevate, this may be the trick. Finally, I want to come into partially uninstalled software. A lot of software packages use what we call COM objects. COM is the devil. It's the absolute devil. How many folks have ever programmed COM before? Yeah, right? Generally, the people that I see that raise their hands have receding hairlines, right? And there's a reason for that, right? Um, so anyway, uh, bottom line, uh, these COM objects get controlled by what we call an inproc server 32 value. Technically, there's a couple other values. Inproc server 32 is like the 99 point whatever percent case. So I don't bother with the other stuff. Uh, or most often don't. Um, sometimes, though, with uninstalled software, we leave stale COM entries left behind. And here's the problem. Uh, very often, you will have executables, current service executables, that will try to invoke COM objects with specific class IDs. And if we can combine bad file system permissions along with uh, basically bad file system permissions along with this uh, leftover COM object, we can often privilege escalate there, right? Um, so again, this one's a little bit more esoteric. I'll mention here that uh, Jimmy Bain, Bohops, did most of the original work on this. Um, he notes this is best used, and we were using the stealthy persistence technique a couple of years ago, uh, because the great thing, when we say stealthy persistence, the awesome thing about this is nobody's looking at your COM keys, right? Nobody looks at your class ID keys uh, during incident response. I know for a fact most people don't. So uh, it's a great place. It doesn't show up in a lot of auto runs. And anyway, uh, bottom line here, in order for this to be a privesque vulnerability, you already have to have weak directory permissions. But again, I'll tell you, that's the one big takeaway from this talk, right, beyond uh, NetSH, right, learn NetSH. The other big takeaway is, for goodness sakes, go audit your directory permissions. Your admins do crazy stupid things with these. Your third-party software does crazy stupid things with these in your program files directories and creates all kinds of problems. So while Jimmy uh, claims that you're probably not going to be able to use this for privilege escalation, I'll say we've used it for privilege escalation. Right now, that said, it does require a secondary vulnerability there, or a secondary misconfig. So where do you go from here? Something I don't have time to dive into is Procmon, but for the good, for goodness sakes, go download Procmon. It's free. It's awesome. Literally, go run Procmon and target a service, a third, particularly third-party services. Right. So if you've got third-party custom software on your machines, right, you can step back and say, okay, what's running as a service currently, and then go run, uh, basically, go run Procmon, and restart the service and see what it does. And in a lot of cases, it's actually trying to run an executable somewhere. Um, and you can look and say, hey, where did it try to run the executable from? Usually, I'll filter on, <coughs> filter on file not found, right? Because that means it tried to find a file. And if the file not found has an exe extension, that means they were probably getting ready to go try and run an execute. Otherwise, they were trying to read data from an executable. That doesn't make any sense, right? Occam's razor says they're trying to run that bad boy, right? Um, so we find a lot of custom vulnerabilities this way, particularly in like, <coughs> custom, uh, custom developed third party apps and whatnot. So, anyway, uh, bottom line here uh, Procmon for the win. This is diving into like weird, you know, industry or sorry, uh, application specific stuff rather than the stuff we covered before that are more generic techniques, right? So, to wrap this up, because I'm like right at the end of my time here. Bottom line, Windows privilege escalation is way easier than it should be. If you don't hunt down the privilege escalation opportunities on your machines, your attackers will. All right, I can tell you this 100%, uh, your apex predators, your apex predators are absolutely doing this. We know this because we do a lot of incident response and I steal a lot of tricks from attackers. By the way, a lot of people talk about purple team, right, where they're like, yeah, I get the red team in and, and the red team you know, works and they try to exploit something and then the blue team says, did you see that right, kind of thing and they work together. 
we do exactly the opposite. I mean, we do regular purple team, but we're doing instant response. And we're like, wow, that looks cool. We get our red team folks in, and we're like, hey, replicate that. Make that part of our toolkit, all right? Uh, so if you are a red teamer and you are not working with your instant response shop, you are missing out. That's all I'm going to say. Anyway, um, so if you're an attacker, good news. Uh, most, system, most system admins still suck at this. And not only do they suck at it in general, they're being trained, they're paying to train and learn how to suck at this, right? So anyway, that's all I've got. I'm right at the end of my time. Uh, I guess you want me to take questions offline or do you have time for a couple here? Five, oh, I got five minutes. Any questions? Okay, well, I won't take questions. I'll take questions offline then, I guess, if no questions. Thanks, everybody, for coming out to Wild West Hacking Fest. And uh, yeah.